So uh, basically, we just got into some of those KPIs. And I know that's kind of a, that's us talking shop, I guess. Not everybody can, not everybody knows these uh, abbreviations off the top of their heads or whatever. So Tom, let's kind of get into it. We'll, we'll break down kind of what each KPI it is that we look for in a lead gen campaign, and then, you know, maybe elaborate on the importance of them as well. Yeah. So, I mean, just going back to just the whole concept of message market media, your three M's, right? Understand, uh, like, before we're getting into any of the data or the definitions of these things, right? Understand um, who you're talking to. How big of a marketplace do you have in terms of potential uh, new customers or clients, right, in your given uh, business, right? So, you know, hey, like, this is what, how big of a pool of an audience I have, right? And from there, at least you have a baseline of how many people um, you're starting with. So, you know, right? And then outside of that, like, what are you trying to say to them? What's that message that's catering to that specific audience, right? What is your offer? Like, ultimately, your offer trumps all, right? Everything else, that is the first domino that is going to make or, make or break anything else. So if you think about it just from a very simplistic standpoint, right? Message, market, media. How big is my market? What am I saying to them? What is the offer that I'm putting in front of them, right? And then the way in which I'm putting that in front of them. That's where all the, the media kind of comes into, Right. So from that standpoint, thinking about these terms when it comes to any type of a plan, right? Click-through rate or CTR. Let me back up before that. Kevin had said KPIs a few different times, right? KPI is an acronym for Key Performance Indicator, right? So what are your KPIs or Key Performance in, uh, um, Indicators when you're looking at, um, you know, just judging the health of a lead generation campaign? So here are some of the terms that you want to understand. CTR, click-through rate, is measuring the percentage of people clicking on your ad or link, right? Meaning how many people saw it and how many people that saw it actually clicked on a link or clicked on the ad, right? That's your click through rate, right? It's a, it's a function of math. Um, clicks. Yeah, to so, go ahead. Or Sorry. Um, with the click through rate, basically the things that I try to keep in mind is if you think about it, if a hundred people see your ad and three people click, you have a 3% click through rate. Right? It's simple math, just like Tom said right there. Um, as a general rule, especially on meta platforms, uh, really across all platforms, if you have a click-through rate that's higher than three, um, providing the rest of your funnel works, you are always good to go. Like that means your offer is awesome. Your creative is awesome. Uh, that is a really good click-through rate. That's always what I set as my bar. Uh, I set the lower end of my click-through rate at around one, right? If if it's a high ticket item, you know, below one may work. But essentially, if if my click through rate is less to one, what that tells me is the thing that I have to fix is the actual ad, and more importantly, it's maybe the start of the ad, right? Because that means my view time is probably low, and probably people just aren't really vibing with whatever it is we're offering. Whether it's the color, the way that it starts, whatever it is, that ad is not working. So if that you know, to, to just kind of put a, a button on that. If your click-through rate is above, you know, three, 5%, you're doing awesome. Cause one in 20, you know, think about the way you use social media. I don't stop one in 20 ads. I see. Actually, Tom, if, if you see a hundred posts on social media, how many do you stop and actually interact with? Mm, not that many. Yeah, I think it's cynical after a few years, you know, like, no, I think it's it's probably consistent right now, you know, like, I'd be less than one for sure. Yeah, for sure. Anyways, yeah, let's, uh, let's move on to clicks per site. Yeah, so clicks the site, track the number of visitors landing on your website, right? So there's click through rate, and then actually landing onto the site itself, right? How many people are you, how many people are going onto your site based off of how many, however, you're sending traffic there? Right, that's literally what it is, right? Clicks to site. Is there any other way to define that? Uh, no, but I think maybe what's good to mention here is a lot of times you'll look at just clicks. Now, clicks is something that's something like, uh, say, Meta. Um, Google uses it as well. Uh, but say in the Meta example, clicks is tracked by when somebody just expands your ad as well, right? If they just want to read what's in the caption or if they just want to maybe turn the sound on on the video or... You know, any interaction at all that results in a user clicking is counted as a click. That's why the actual measurable one is how many people are clicking out to the site, right? So that's who's interested in your actual lead gen campaign. It's very different. And then like the follow-up metric from that is landing page visitors, 
right? Because there's always going to be a discrepancy between your clicks to site and your landing page visitors. That would do be because of like uh, low site load times, um, slow site like a little bit slow site load times. I can't say that phrase. Um, or or a number of other things, right? But but essentially, clicks to site lets you know is your ad working. What percentage of people are clicking through? That's how the click-through rate is actually designed. Uh, and then that's a number I put a dollar value on, right? If my clicks to site is, you know, in, in many campaigns, I run it at $2. You know, if it's more expensive than that, I know I have to change the ad. If it's less expensive than that, um, then I know we're, we're good to go there. And then any issues might be showing up farther down in the funnel. So, you know, just to kind of preface this as well with Kevin's metrics, right? Um, it's going to vary across industries. So just keep that in mind as well. You know, like when you hear $2, when I hear $2 and maybe, for example, for like, say, a DUI attorney in San Francisco, um, your AdWords average cost is $95 plus per click, right? A $2 clicks to site in that sense is amazing, right? So mm -hmm. always have that understanding in place too for your own industry. Like, what is that? What are those averages? And a simple place you can go look, maybe uh, just Google, right? To understand that as well. Um, so yeah, some things to think about. So I guess uh, the next thing is going to be looking at landing page conversion rate. What does that mean, right? Effectively, how we have that definition here is calculate the percentage of visitors converting into leads on the landing page. So it's simple math, right? In the context of how many people landed on the landing page and then took an action, right? Whatever action it is that you're asking them to take whether there's fill out a form, call a number, whatever that is, right? You want to look at that math. Total number of people that got there, how many people took action? And that would be your conversion rate, right? Mm -hmm. And now, Tom, on a landing page, what is it that actually goes into the conversion rate? So like the written content, the offer, what what else would go into that? Yeah, there's there's obviously there's congruency, right? No one wants to be uh, bait and switched. So you think about where that the person came from. If they saw an ad, the ad spoke to them and they clicked on that ad and that ad took them to the landing page. Make sure that the landing page is saying the same thing that your ad is and just it, if they're right, effectively expanding on that, right? So um, when it comes to the landing page in itself, make sure that Kevin, you had said this earlier, your speed load time is quick. It's optimized for both mobile and desktop. But then the messaging more than anything is playing to the person that you're talking to message your market, right? Who are you talking to? What is that offer? What is that problem that they have that you can solve for them so that you are essentially the uh, guide in their hero's journey? I have this itch. I have this problem. Can you know, Kevin or Tom's company or this landing page, can this company actually help me solve that problem? Right. And if so, how do I how do I raise my hand and say I'm interested in, in having you help me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's presenting the offer in a really easy way that users can digest. That congruency was a huge point. Make sure your ad looks like your landing page. You know, like if it doesn't make sense or if your ad is too vague and sounds too awesome, but your landing page has all the details, you know, that that would be a reason that people kind of uh, uh, choose not to take action. Yeah, absolutely. Now, like it's tough to say uh, in a lead gen campaign uh, what what a page can convert at because that's 100% on the offer and the industry. Uh, with a good enough offer, if, you know, you could see conversion rates, you know, upwards of 20, 25% if it's the right kind of promotion. Uh, but for high ticket items, you know, something kind of at two, 3%, it's still a winning campaign right? It's, it's just important to know the rest of the numbers, right? Yeah. And just for a kind of reference and definition, high ticket item, right? It's something more than just like, say, an impulse buy. So if you got to sit back and actually consider this, maybe do some research on that vendor, right? That service provider, um, whatever it is, before you make a decision, those are things that are considered high ticket. So that could be anywhere from a couple hundred dollars, right? Upwards of tens of thousands of dollars. So think about it from that standpoint. It's like, you're not going to do an, an ex extensive amount of research on say like an impulse buy that might be nine dollars ten dollars maybe even 17 to 20 bucks right but you will take a step back do a sniff test do some research on something that may um run you a couple hundred dollars in uh, upwards to, to a few thousand right mm, yeah absolutely absolutely it's it's 100 different and that's a lot of the times why you have to make that definition between lead gen and e-com agencies and and you know it's just defining what your objective is right now our next point that we have here is your appointment booking percentage. This is when it goes from marketing to sales. This is the handoff 
um, this is where the planning actually becomes more important because typically everything in the first couple steps is what we do as marketers. But when we have to hand it off to sales teams or the business owners, you know, that's where where we lose our our expertise here. So our appointment booking percentage, essentially what that does is it measures the number of leads versus the number of appointments. If 100 people became leads, put their hand up, said, I want this offer, but only 10% of them showed up to their sales call or, or meeting or trial lesson, you know, that is your appointment booking percentage there. Um, when we're discussing this, there's a ton of tools that you can use. Um, SMS, you know, drift campaigns, you know, we get into that all the time. Uh, there's lots of ways to influence it, but at the same time, like if you can't get these people on the phone, these people are not going to buy anything from you. So Tom, can you think of any reasons like why people wouldn't be, you know, that put their hand up and say like, I want this offer, but a lot of times business owners have trouble getting hold of those people. Yeah. Why is their appointment booking percentage low? Yeah. I mean, it could be anything from psychology of that actual buyer uh, to um, the urgency, right? Oftentimes, if you think about it, there is going to be a gap between a lead that's generated to an actual appointment that shows up. So one thing you may want to think about is just commitment level, right? Your service. If your product or service is quote unquote considered more high ticket, what can you do to encourage that person to show up? One, oftentimes, if you think about it from more of a pessimistic standpoint, people love to buy. They don't like being sold. So mm -hmm. the just overall um, picture or concept of an appointment with someone, right, where your product or service is more just high ticket or more just, say, personal, oftentimes people know that, uh, you know, that assumption that's taking place is I don't want to get sold on this appointment, so I may or may not want to show up. I just kind of want to see what this is about. I, got, I just want to put my foot in the water and just test those things. Right. So that's mm. one thing to consider. Another thing to consider also is like making sure that um, and there's other ways, there's many ways to do this, but making sure that your possible follow up sequence, right, to get them to show up um, is dialed in as well, because oftentimes people are busy. Right. You may sign up for an appointment that you booked, but if there's no reminders, life happens. People are going to forget. So mm -hmm. how can you be proactive in that in, in that journey? Right. Yeah. And also, you know, like you said, at certain times, I really want something. You know, like they're right there. I need this new software. You know, I can't figure out how to follow up with people. So if you call me right away, if your speed to lead is really good, yeah, you're going to get this appointment booked. But if I don't hear from you for a few days because your follow-up sequence isn't good, your appointment booking percentage is way down. Um, now, next, after you actually book people into their call, into their appointment, into their trial lesson, how many of them actually come back? How many of them actually pull out their credit card and say, I want your service? That is your sales percentage. One of the most vital, vital statistics for any organization um, and something that there is billions and billions of websites and books and pages of content. Like there's no shortage of, of information on how to increase your sales percentage. Um, Tom, do you have anything that we kind of left out on sales percentage or do you want to get straight into fulfillment? I mean, sales percentage is going to vary across different industries. Again, know your own industry, right? Um, oftentimes too, if you're a consultant or if you're a business owner that hasn't done any type of cold traffic, quote unquote, lead generation campaign, right? You may have the mis, uh, uh, you know, misnomer of the fact that um, one common objection that we hear in, in, in our world is uh, these internet leads don't work, right? Uh, mainly because the difference is you may be taking that business owner from a place of where most of their business has come from referrals and not from working cold leads, if you will, right? There's a different cadence, different conversation that happens. A referral is going to be a lot closer, right, to um, a, a deal because of that warm transfer of trust and, and the fact that it is a referral as opposed to someone that knows maybe nothing about you, right? So they may be problem and solution aware, but they may not be your unique solution aware. So those are some things to think about. Does your sales team or you, are you how how many reps, how comfortable are you with taking on this new type of um, uh, lead into your business, right? And if you're not, you're going to have to understand that um, it's a new skill set. It's a new um, muscle that you're going to need to train when you look at those naturally, right? Would would you agree or disagree, right? Mm -hmm. um, your sales percentage is going to be higher from a referral than it would be from someone that doesn't know you. Think about it from that standpoint, right? Nine times out of 10, when you talk to a business owner who's never done 
any kind of lead generation campaigns and they've only done referrals, you know, when you say, what's your sales percentage? Like the answer you're getting is like 80%, 75%. When you talk to somebody who's like, you know, some of the most savvy salespeople in the world, you know, they're telling you that their percentages is like 10%, right? Because it's, that's cold traffic versus referral, you know, and even 10% in, in a big enough industry, that's, that's pretty tough, you know, like, to, to be fair, not everybody's ready at every time. Your sales percentage, though, is essentially, you could argue, the most important statistic, right? Yeah. Ultimately, if you can get people on the phone and, and sell them what you're trying to get, that that's how money comes in, right? Uh, one often overlooked step here is the fulfillment percentage, right? Like, this is the amount of people that tell me, yeah, I want a website versus actually have a website built. There's a huge variance there, right? Because a lot of people want a website, but not everybody wants to pay thousands of dollars to get it done properly, right? Or not every, and it's not on them. They still want it, but it may not be the right time for them in their business, right? Uh, people can fa can fall off here for a number of reasons. Maybe you're not taking a deposit. Uh, maybe the time between your actual sales call and and the billing procedure is too long or your onboarding sequence is messy or just they turn around and they tell their spouse and their spouse is like, nah, you can't pay $7,000 for marketing help or whatever, whatever it is in this example, right? Um, it gets everybody, everybody's, as a business owner, you've probably been on both ends of this many times. Uh, and then the last thing that I, I track not necessarily on a campaign by campaign basis, but just as like a general overall health thing. If, if say, for example, you sell cars and if a person buys a car off you once, you have historical data that says they're probably going to buy their next car and their next car off you. You know, like the average return customer rate is like 2.5 or something like that. Um, you can't really count that on your initial report because things happen you can't count money that you don't have in your pocket yet but that is like extremely valuable information to have and to share with your client or you know even in your own kind of campaign right because future money is still good money to have rolling in um is there anything i'm, I'm leaving out there for like re repeat business um, for repeat business, no, I would say also think about the season that someone's in. Kevin, you had touched on this earlier. Um, not everyone is ready to buy right now or that impulse buy or, you know, that feeling of buying that thing when they opted in may have gone away. Life may have gotten, gotten, you know, in, in front of them or gotten to them. Right. So you're thinking about it from that standpoint of like, say multiple purchases, right. Um, the timing of that may be, um, off for whatever reason, it may not be you or the offer. It just might be timing in their life or circumstances, timing and circumstances changes all. So when it comes down to that, it's important to have a follow-up or nurturing sequence in place because that person that you're acquiring as a new lead or a, a new lead and ultimately a new customer, think about it from that standpoint. If I am going to go out to the people store and get new people, right, for my for my offer, then um, what does that cost to get new people versus the cost to get the same people that I have to come back and buy something um, either come back, come for the first time, right, because I've already acquired their information or come back multiple times, okay?